President Volodymyr Zelensky has sharply criticized the human rights organization Amnesty International after it alleged Ukraine had endangered civilians by basing its troops in residential areas. Zelensky equated the claim to victim blaming. And meanwhile, on the ground in Ukraine, there are reports of heavy fighting in the south, close to the Russian-held city of Kherson. And in the eastern Donetsk region, Ukrainian civilians have fled their homes, forced to leave by incessant Russian shelling. A train station in Donetsk, evacuating the old and the young, all exhausted westwards. Ordinary Ukrainians caught up in fierce fighting and forced to leave their homes with whatever they can carry. We are from a village near Lysychansk. It's between the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. Our village has been ruined. There's no gas, no water, no electricity. We were sitting in the basement for a month. The army brought us here. The government has ordered civilians to leave combat zones in Donetsk. But the danger may not be just from Russian attacks. Amnesty International accuses Ukraine of basing troops in populated areas, putting civilians at risk and violating the laws of war. Kyiv was furious. If someone prepares a report in which the victim and the aggressor are allegedly the same in some way, if information about the victim is analysed while something the aggressor does is ignored, this cannot be tolerated. I understand that this particular piece of work, because it's critical of the behaviour of uh, of Ukrainian forces, is not appreciated by the Ukrainian authorities and by many others. But the fact is that, you know, international law um, applies to everyone. Ukrainian soldiers face a grinding battle to keep the remaining regions of eastern Donbass out of Russian control and to avoid shelling. We sit in the trenches. The enemy shells us and we can't even stick our heads out. Now there are no small arms fights as there used to be. Today it is an artillery battle. You just jump into the trench and wait for the strike. Away from the front lines, the evacuation of civilians from Donetsk continues. The question is whether that will be enough to keep them safe. Let's dig into this with DW correspondent Matthias Bolenga in Kyiv. Uh, Matthias, I'd like to talk more about that report from Am Amnesty International that we just heard about. You've read it. What is the human rights organization accusing Ukraine of exactly? Well, the, uh, the Amnesty International is saying that uh, uh, Ukraine is basing troops near civilian objects, near residential areas, that they're using schools and hospitals to host troops and that that would put civilians at danger because these schools or hospitals would then be bombed and, 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 and uh, uh, then also neighboring um, apartment blocks or whatever, civilian objects, shops, etc., uh, might be also hit. So they are basically accusing Ukraine of not duly protecting civilians uh, by this, these tactics, and they are suggesting that Ukraine would better um, keep its troops either in designated military compounds or they have also written in woods nearby or, or similar places so that they would not be close to civilians and that any attack on them would not endanger civilians. Now, you've been covering the war in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Based on your experience, how accurate are the report's findings? So the fact that uh, Ukrainian troops are in the cities, in the city, same cities, of course, that where civilians live, that's not a secret. Um, everybody knows that. And uh, I have also seen um, troops uh, being in, in, in public buildings, in buildings that used to be uh, used to civilian purposes before the war. Um, so this is definitely happening, and it's definitely happening that uh, close to these areas, uh, shells go down uh, that People suspect that they were aimed at these 
specific facilities. Um, but there are several flaws in this report. First of all, of course, um, we've asked the same question actually to military commanders, to civilian uh, administrative personnel, politicians in Ukraine. And what we heard was, how do you protect the city? Um, the Russians are trying to take these cities and we need to defend them. So how do you defend the city without being in the city? And that's something, of course, um, uh, Amnesty's uh, military advice might uh, not be very uh, ad adequate on you cannot defend the city by hosting your troops in a forest nearby and uh, the Ukrainian army pretty much fears open field battles because they say they don't have the capacity to meet Russians in the open field. That would be uh, a very uh, dangerous tactics for, for the soldiers and lead to many casualties among the soldiers. Um, so in order to protect the cities, they need to be in there. I've also, they've also said that um, um, when talking specifically about buildings like schools or or, or whatever it was at that uh, uh, specific uh, time that they always evacuate these buildings. They're not hosting the soldiers in the same facility where civilians are. Um, and uh, that there is often no alternative because these are the only sturdy buildings. But the biggest um, flaw of this report is that they accuse Ukraine of not doing enough to protect the civilians by evacuating them. Now that's outrightly false because Ukraine has started a huge evacuation mission from uh, the Donbas in April. They've asked every civilian to leave the region and they've also offered transport and evacuation mm -hmm. trains, buses, etc. And these have been running until the last moment. They have been attacked by the Russians, if you remember the attack on Kramatorsk. So um, uh, uh, this is outrightly uh, false and they do not even mention these efforts. Um, so this is definitely a, a, a problem of this report. Okay, Matthias Bollinger for us in Ukraine. Thank you for that update. And for more on this, let's bring in Donatella Rovera. She's a senior crisis response advisor at Amnesty International. Welcome, Ms. Rover. Your organization accuses Ukrainian forces of violating international law. Can you give us more details? Uh, yes, the press release that we um, issued is based on the documentation uh, carried out over a number of months in different areas of Ukraine where um, our researchers have observed um, Ukrainian forces basing themselves in schools, uh, residential buildings, at time hospitals in close proximity to where civilians live. Uh, which, of course, um, endangers those civilians who, who, who live um, in, in, the, in these buildings where the uh, soldiers uh, uh, locate themselves right next to them. Um, and and uh, I, I, Amnesty International, our concern is with the protection of, of civilians. And uh, such conduct is uh, in violation of international law and put civilians at risk. So that's why we are raising this issue. Um, yeah, the report has been met that, with, with quite uh, fierce backlash from the Ukrainian president, though he is accusing Amnesty of victim blaming. What do you make of that? Well, that is regrettable because uh, I think if he takes a look at Amnesty's website, he will find uh, a very significant body of work, several reports, many more press releases based on our field investigations where we document extensively and in great details uh, war crimes and other serious violations of international law by Russian forces, including use of banned weapons, indiscriminate and deliberate strikes on civilians, extrajudicial execution, torture, abductions. So we as Amnesty International have been carrying out field investigations on the ground in Ukraine and documenting in great details Russia's war crimes for the past six months. All this information is available on the public Public record hmm. on our website. That those reports have uh, generally um, been met with praise. Now the team that carried out the research on this uh, particular press release that we issued yesterday is the same team of people, the same researchers using the same methodology. So it's yeah. not really credible to say that 99% of our work is great and proper uh, and good and and one uh, piece of work 
uh, that details uh, violations by Ukrainian forces, which have also been documented by others, yeah. uh, including the UN, Human Rights Watch, and other, to say that It wasn't that just that Zelensky who was upset by the report. Sorry to interject there. I want to talk about something that has kind of caught our attention. The head of your Ukraine bureau, Oksana Pokalchuk, wrote in a social media post that she tried to stop the publication of this report, saying the country team was not involved and that the findings are based on, quote, inadmissible and incomplete material. What went wrong there? Um, I don't know. I think that the only person who uh, could explain that would be the person who made that statement. I would simply point out that Amnesty Ukraine has not been involved in carrying out any investigation or documenting the uh, war crimes uh, committed by Russia since the beginning of the crisis. That has been done by the same team of researchers who have uh, carried out uh, the research into into the statement that we made yesterday. So I, I cannot speak uh, for uh, for Oksana. I think that um, you know she would have to explain her position herself. I, I don't have anything to to comment on that. If there are these kinds of of internal divisions, though, can your your crew and your organization be trusted to to objectively defend? Um, the civilians' best interests and, and human rights in Ukraine? Uh, I think, again, the uh, enormous body of work that Amnesty International has published uh, to date on uh, war crimes uh, committed by Russian forces all over Ukraine, uh, you know, that is available on the public record and anybody can see it. Um, so, you know, the methodology is the same. The staff that have carried out the work is the same. Uh, I understand that this particular piece of work, because it's critical of the behavior of, uh, of Ukrainian forces, is not appreciated by the Ukrainian authorities and by many others. But mm. the fact is that, you know, international law um, applies to everyone. Uh, and we, as Amnesty International, have a duty to investigate and report on uh, human rights abuses, um, it, violation of international law, regardless of who are the perpetrators or the victims. I mean, in this yeah. case, of course, the victims are also Ukrainians. So tell her, um, we're going to have to know, leave it there. Is, Thank you so much for your time. Otherwise. Thank you. We're joined now by Andreas Schiele. He's the director of the International Crimes and Accountability Program at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. Mr. Schiele, good to see you. What do you make of the Amnesty International report? Well, the report shows who pays the biggest price in, in a war and in, in every war. So that's the civilians. They, they pay a extremely huge price, especially if they are caught between the two fighting um, parties uh, and, and forces, basically. Um, nevertheless, there are obligations under international law for armies um, to spare the civilians, to protect them. Um, and, and, and they need to be obliged also by, by all parties. It remains obvious that Russia is the aggressor here, aggressor here and that, that um, the number of um, very well-documented war crimes by Russia but again, also um, all, all parties to the conflict have certain legal responsibilities to spare the civilian population. Nonetheless, Ukraine's president responded with harsh criticism, saying that the report precisely equated the victim with the aggressor. What is your take on that? I think it shows that, that uh, impartial and independent investigations are needed and um, if possible, also court judgments uh, in, in fair and international um, um, style procedures to um, basically uh, come to conclusions here. I mean, there's not an allegation of war crimes, but of um, 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 neglecting the, um, the rules of war and, and, and the humanitarian law. Um, and and that, that's serious. That can be corrected, of course. Um, but it's also clear that it's used um, in, in such a war by both sides, um, um, uh, from from a more propagandistic view, um, and, and that shows that independent investigations are extremely necessary to shed some light into the situations. What could be the legal consequences for Ukraine and its forces if these accusations prove to be true? Um, I mean, we are not talking about war crimes here, so it's not criminal law, it's not prosecutions. Um, there could be some forms of, of reparations um, for the victims. 
who suffered in this situation be at stake. Um, but overall, you also have to see that um, armies worldwide um, um, unfortunately um, breach the law and, and use um, civilian installations to also have military installations there, providing the other side basically a basis to shell this area um, potentially legally if it's not um, unproportionate. Um, so it's it's something in the in the fog of war that um, happens in each and every war, and and um, the legal consequences are more on the, on the reparation side, but uh, not so much on the on the war crimes or prosecution side here. You recently wrote that the conflict in Ukraine could transform international criminal justice, and how so? Um, as there's such a focus on international criminal justice, there are chances and and risks. So the chances are that the body of law that the practice. Um, Jurisprudence develops out of the conflict through so many cases, but the risks are also that instruments that states and others instrumentalize international criminal law, um, so in, in, a, in, a, in a very bad and worrying um, um, direction. And as I think impartial and independent investigations uh, and court cases and legal cases are important um, to uh, draw the right balance here, um, because it's not black and white. You have a clear aggressor here. You have a clear war crimes here. Um, but you need also proper investigations to prove that. Andrea Schiller of the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, thanks so much for your time. Well, Russia's president says he's looking to boost trade and economic ties with Turkey. Vladimir Putin was speaking at a meeting with Turkey's president in the Black Sea resort of Sochi. Recep Tayyip Erdogan said he hoped the talks would open a, quote, different page in ties with Moscow. The leaders are also set to discuss the grain deal brokered in part by Turkey, which allowed the safe passage of Ukrainian grain. It's their second meeting since Putin invaded Ukraine. So a lot to unpack there. Let's bring in our correspondent Dorian Jones in Istanbul and DW's Russia analyst Konstantin Agat joining me from Vilnius. Good to see you both. Uh, Dorian, I'd like to start with you. What does Turkish President Erdogan have to gain from this meeting? Well, I think he has a packed agenda, but he is speaking ahead of his meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin. He said that the Ukraine grain deal will be a key item on their talks uh, for Turkey, which brokered this deal with the UN. It is seen as a major diplomatic triumph. And Erdogan will be uh, pressuring Erdogan, uh, Putin to continue with this, uh, this ongoing process uh, as for Erdogan, because he sees this as not only a diplomatic success, but also a vindication of his close ties with Putin. And he has faced a lot of criticism from his Western allies, uh, but he's always insisted that maintaining relations with Putin is essential for progress to be made. Also, Erdogan will be raising the question of Syria. He wants to launch a major military operation against Syrian Kurds. He says that a link to an insurgency inside Turkey. Now, this operation is targeting an area where Russia is in control and he needs the support of Russia to get a, go ahead with that operation. But Putin has been very reluctant over this. He's very aware of Turkey's growing military presence in Syria and is also aware of the targets that Turkey is proposing, these key towns of Tel Arafat and Manbij, which is causing a great deal of concern, not only for Russia, but also uh, Russia's ally in Syria, Iran, and the Assad regime, who both strongly oppose any operation. But Erdogan and Putin are really adept at managing differences and in many ways often coming up with very creative solutions. It all depends what Erdogan has to offer in exchange for a Russian green light. So let's first dig in a little bit deeper onto that diplomatic triumph, as you call it, for the grain deal that was partially brokered by uh, Turkey. Konstantin, given that praise, do you think that Erdogan could also play a role in moving Putin closer to some kind of peace agreement in Ukraine? Well, it's, it's a more mm, kind of pertinent question today than it was even five days ago, because after Chancellor Schroeder, former Chancellor Schroeder of Germany, uh, gave an interview uh, in which he said that Putin is open to negotiations actually, act, after actually meeting with Putin. We may think, I mean, th there is a ground, let's say, to think that Moscow really wants to have some kind of talks. And in this respect, Erdogan is, of course, uh, the best candidate to be a mediator since Russia's uh, falling out with Israel. Erdogan is pretty much the only global leader and definitely the only NATO country leader who is still on speaking terms with Vladimir Putin. So yes, why not? Maybe they will discuss something tentatively, although I think that even if they do, it won't be 
put on the table straight away after this meeting. That usually takes a bit more time. And Dorian, I want to get a bit more about the interesting role that Turkey plays here. It's been walking a political tightrope when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Um, on the one hand, it's not supporting international sanctions against Russia, but on the other, it's delivering drones to Ukraine. How do those two pieces fit together? Well, Turkey is from the very onset of this conflict. has always argued it's been in a very difficult situation, given that the Ukraine and Russia are neighbors across the Black Sea. Uh, and even before the conflict started, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan had very close relations with both the Ukrainian and the Russian presidents. And in many ways, as this conflict unfolded, Turkey has played what they describe as this balanced approach. Yes, on the one side, they've been providing Ukraine with very sophisticated uh, drones, which have been very uh, successful in, in inflicting a lot of damage on Russian hardware. But at the same time, they haven't they haven't uh, imposed Russian sanctions uh, that are from the, its Western allies, in spite of a lot of criticism coming from many of its allies. And Erdogan has always insisted we have to play this balanced approach. We have to keep on talking to Russia. In fact, ahead of the, the flight assault, he reiterated, we, if we want a peaceful solution to the Ukraine conflict, you've got to talk to Russia. And Erdogan believes he's positioned himself as really the only the Western leader that can talk with both the Ukrainian leaders, the Russian leaders, as well as being a NATO uh, partner as well. So Turkey believes that even if it isn't yet both sides, either Ukraine or or Russia are ready for peace talks yet, if they are and when they are, Turkey is in an ideal position. And I think that they will be looking going forward, at least for early steps and uh, um, building on the Green Deal success, possible prisoner exchanges between Russia and Ukraine. And that is something also Erdogan is expected to bring up, as to build momentum from the initial success of this Green Deal. Okay, our correspondent Dorian Jones in Istanbul and Russia analyst Konstantin Egger, thank you both so much for that update.